with programming. So take it away, Silva. Hi, everybody. Uh, so generally speaking, when I give talks these days, uh, I talk about a programming language called Pony that I work on, which is an actor model language that has a data race free type system and it has an entirely lock free runtime. Uh, it has both shared, it has both mutable state that you pass and immutable state that you can share and all sorts of interesting things. That is absolutely not what I'm going to talk about today. Instead, today, I want to talk about how do we write the runtimes for these interesting languages, right? How do we write the memory allocators, the garbage collectors, the schedulers, the message passing systems, queuing, work stealing, all this stuff? Because what we don't do is we don't write them in Pony. We don't write them in Erlang. We don't write them in these lovely high-level languages that I adore. We write them in C and C++ if we're really masochistic. But uh, generally speaking, C. Um, and one of the interesting things about that is that writing languages is, is hugely fun. I, I enjoy it tremendously. Uh, parsers and symbol tables and type checkers and all of these things, um, these are quite straightforward to express as sensible, well-typed programs. You can get all kinds of excellent guarantees over your program that really matter and really make a, make, make a difference in terms of both developing it and executing it. That's good. Uh, fundamentally, the problem of writing a programming language is sort of horrifyingly simple. You, you take some text, you parse it, and create, a, create an, a tree. And then we create a new tree from that tree, and a new tree from that tree, and a new tree from that tree. As we go through all our steps, whether we're you know, going from parse trees to ASTs to doing type checking to doing optimization, that's fine. And at the end, we then emit another blob, right? It might be text as an AR, it might be object code, whatever it is. But it's a really straightforward problem because programming languages are optimized for writing programming languages because they're developed by programming language authors, right? Fundamentally, that's what a programming language is for. It's for scratching our own itch. Unfortunately, writing runtimes is exciting. And exciting is not the same thing as fun. Uh, I hope there's a little bit of overlap there, but... Um, Sometimes I do wonder if that really is an empty set. Uh, and I spend significantly more time writing runtimes than I do writing programming languages. Uh, that said, just as an example, um, the Pony compiler itself uh, is relatively big these days. I think it's up to about 50,000 lines of code. And the runtime is pretty compact. It's about 8,000 lines of code, and that includes a memory allocator, a garbage collector, a work stealing scheduler, asynchronous I.O., all this stuff. It's much smaller, and actually it does a smaller task. The compiler does something actually fundamentally more complex, but I spend more time on the runtime because it's so much more difficult to write and to debug. Okay, so, uh, because we don't write programming languages that are optimized for writing runtimes. Okay, before I go on, First, let's talk about what I mean by that. I keep using these terms, and I want to make sure that we're clear about what we're talking about. When we talk about a runtime, uh, we're talking about features like this. This is a big list. I'm not going to go through it. Uh, but these are the kinds of things that we're talking about. We're talking about things that are, generally speaking, not visible to the programmer. If they're using the feature, the intention is they should be using it at a higher level and not thinking about the implementation. If we're really flattering ourselves, we say that we write runtimes where these things are actually replaceable, right? You could go through and replace the garbage collector for some language. Uh, wow, that's desperately untrue. But it is what we try to think, how we try to think about these things. And importantly, not all runtimes have all these elements, right? You can go from languages that have the simplest possible runtime that I can think of, which is the ability to create a stack and begin executing. All the way to uh, languages that are, have all of these features, including JIT compilation and things like this. Okay, so what I want to talk about here is something that absolutely doesn't exist. This is all vaporware, and that's kind of the fun of it, which is uh, a language for writing runtimes. So we use C and C++ and assembly. Uh, interestingly, I think Rust could be an interesting language, uh, given Nico's talk, for writing runtimes, but uh, really, when we say, oh, I use C to write a runtime, that's a lie too, right? Because I can't use all of C to write a runtime. I can use some subset of C. What I can't do is uh, touch parts of C that you might expect to use normally, or C++, gosh, 
uh, off the top of my head, I'd say 80% of C++ is unusable when writing a runtime. People use it, but you can't touch these segments. And sure, there's things that are pretty straightforward, like runtime type information and exceptions and things like that. But how about heap allocation? People mostly expect to be able to do heap allocation in C. It's part of libc. It's part of the runtime. Well, it isn't. libc is actually a library. The runtime for, T, for, for C is called uh, CRT, right? And it's a collection of object files in Linux that you link with your uh, main dot ob, dot .o, essentially, that provide things like creating a stack, the very earliest possible things, parsing your environment, things like this, things that you don't generally think of because they're, they're so low level, they're not even in libc. And those are the things that you can use. So uh, why do we use these languages? And, and some of the patterns that we use there when we're writing runtimes explains why we use these languages. And w casting away type information, uh, exploiting weak memory. Um, how about hand tuning implementations for target architectures? That's a big deal. But there's also uh, huge amounts of very low-level bit twiddling. I was chatting with Joe this morning about uh, modular arithmetic, and he very rightly pointed out that modular arithmetic is, on average, a bug, right? But if you're writing a runtime, it's not. You're depending on modular arithmetic on known bit width uh, integer types in order to get high-performance runtimes. Most other cases, it's a bug. Uh, so that's interesting. Can we do better than the tools that we have right now? Well, I got a list of demands. <laughs> That's what I've got. What do I need if I'm going to do this? And this is sort of an outline of what I'm going to talk about. The first is type state like linearity and ownership, all right? That has to be integrated with some concept of alias tracking. You don't have any choice on that. You have to have that. And by type state, I mean to say that some memory location does not have a type in the static sense. It has a type at a point in time. It has a temporal type, and that type can change over time. And importantly, that type has to change in some understandable way that you can reason about. Now, you can go all the way and say, well, I really want to reason about it, and so I'm going to uh, try and implement this using a formally verified language like F star. But there, you run back into the original performance problems that we're going to try and think about a little bit here. So type state. The next thing is uh, relaxed linearity for atomic ownership transfer. That's pretty specific, but it's because I'm talking about a specific paper, and I'm going to talk about it particularly on a, on a forthcoming slide. But the idea here is to say, if I have something, and that something may be complex, it might not be a single number or a single memory address, it might be a very complex thing, I need to be able to give that thing to someone else, and someone on average in a runtime means another threat of execution, but not always. It can be another module of the program. And do that atomically across the thing. I don't mean just in the sense of atomic operations, but including that. The other thing is you need a precise happens before annotation. So uh, happens before is, in, in, in the hardware sense, a very strict idea of happens before. This thing must be observable before this thing takes effect. So there's a causal happens before relationship there that you need to be able to establish. Most of the time, and actually Alberto's talk was excellent on this, and I had to add a slide to my talk because of his, because of his talk. Uh, most of the time, that's expressed in program order. That's fundamentally wrong for a runtime. Expressing things in program order does not tell us how we want to execute things in a runtime. I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, and finally, we need some kind of exhaustively tested models. We want to be able to say, for any given target architecture, the happens before annotations that we're talking about can be most efficiently represented given some stream of instructions that depends on the target ISA, right? That mapping has to be independent from the compiler itself. Otherwise, you're back in the, with anarchy trying to hand tune implementations for any arbitrary target architecture. So. I'm going to use as a running example a memory allocator. Uh, you can insert nearly any example here, but a memory allocator is a nice one because uh, quite nicely, Nico pointed out, what's the first thing that you add to your language without a runtime? It's a memory allocator. Yeah. Uh, does anyone know who Saul Williams is? <laughs> 
go find a song by Saul Williams called uh, called the title of this slide. I got a list of demands. But anyway, uh, so adding a memory allocator first is is generally speaking the right thing to do. Um, arguably, there are some interesting runtime features you could have with a, with a language that only has a, a stack. Fourth is an example of that. But let's talk about a memory allocator. So. Uh, what you can't do in this situation is reuse the system allocator or incorporate an allocator library because essentially what you've done at that point is said, hey, someone else, uh, implement my memory allocator for me. Okay, that's fine. Thank you for doing that. Um, that's often a really good idea, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about that person who has to go implement that thing in the first place. You can't use any higher level features, right? Because those things all depend on memory allocation. There's nothing left. There's nothing you can use. So these are not pure functional programs, right? We can't write a purely functional memory allocator. It is the very embodiment of side effects. Uh, we can't write a data race free allocator because address space is a global resource, right? So somehow we're going to manage that. How are we gonna do that? These things are filthy. So let's start with what type is it? All right, my all time favorite call in the history of, of programming is malloc. Void star malloc size t size. Fantastic. We've all used that about one billion times each. What in the world does that return? How could you possibly describe that in type theory as to what that returns? Okay, so what we have there really is there is a type, right? It's the type that the language decides it is after it mallocs and it says, okay, now I'm going to declare uh, post hoc that that's the type that that thing is and that it. It's probably the same size, maybe, we hope. Um, what was it before it was allocated? Because we can talk about it in terms of dependent types. We can say, oh, this is a buffer of bytes, and we know that it has uh, length size, and fantastic, isn't that interesting? No, no, no. Really, what type was it? What type was it before you allocated the memory? And what's it going to be after you free it? All right. Let's start with uh, a very uh, small example. This is uh, an example of fresh allocation. This is from a real memory allocator. Uh, it is sadly written in C++, and worse yet, it is written by me. I apologize. But uh, it's a pretty fast and low footprint allocator. Like, we had reasons for doing this. Um, were they good reasons? But we did it. So there's a little bit of complication here. We have uh, doubly linked lists of slab links, and it's a pointer to a doubly linked list and all this stuff. But really, the piece that I'm gonna focus on here is assuming we have a link to some size class of memory, right? What we wanna do is get the slab that's associated with that size class. Link, get slab. That's returning some, if people, if people are familiar with slab allocators, like in the Linux kernel and stuff like that, just a big chunk of memory that you're going to divide up later. It's not that complicated. But the point of this is that call under the hood is horrific. So we have some uh, constant expressions up at the top there that define some sizes of things. And for some reason, we have a mask that's based on the size of something. And then we have get slab. And look what that returns. It returns a slab pointer. But really? <laughs> is that is that okay? Slab pointer that is based on casting this to a size t and then masking it based on some... Why is that an acceptable type? All I've done there is say, ah, maybe it's type. Whee! Okay, so this is interesting because before we allocated this memory at the language level, it had a type. And it... it the key part of this is that that type is temporal, like I was talking about before. A slab is a big chunk of memory we're going to divide up later, right? That means that has a type. But little bits that we've divided up previously have a type, even though they are part of the larger area of memory. And what if we uh, hand those bits back to the allocator? That has a different type. That's already sliced up, but available memory, as opposed to not yet sliced up, but available memory. And those slabs are parts of super slabs, and super slabs are part of thread-based allocators, and thread-based allocators are part of programs that can share data at, at, share data at the runtime level, 
hopefully not at the language level. Uh, and all of those things need their own independent types that change over time. Okay, so in this particular case, this is a pretty classic example. Slab-based allocation is uh, really old hat at this point. Um, and in this case, the reason why that mask was okay is because slabs are always aligned on 64 kilobytes of memory, always. That means you can mask off some internal pointer and find the head of the slab with, with a single AND operation. This is an example of what I mean by runtime efficiency. These are the kinds of things that are actually totally unacceptable to do in a normal programming language, but at a runtime level, you have to do these tricks. Otherwise, when you go and you run your profiler, you're going to discover you spend all of your time in your runtime. That's exactly what we want to avoid. We want that thing to barely show up. So it turns out that when you encode, remember I mentioned there was this doubly linked list of slabs? Well, you don't want to allocate nodes in a doubly linked list in your allocator, right? That's, you can see the recursive problem there. So instead, a slab with free memory can be encoded on a doubly linked list by reusing the free memory inside the slab. So that's another kind of temporal type state that's attached to free memory in a slab, which is an element in a, in a doubly linked list that encodes the presence of the slab itself. I hope I'm making this sound horrifically complex. Uh, so, what do we do this? How do we express that type relationship? Right? We don't want to keep doing this all the time. By the way, that's exactly what the code does. It keeps doing this all the time. Uh, we want to express that as some useful type relationship that's based on an underlying knowledge of things like alignment and type states. OK. Now, type states can be combined with ownership. And we get type states and ownership put together. Now you have something that starts getting really interesting in terms of parallelism. And parallelism is really the goal of runtimes right now. If you're writing a single-threaded runtime, I've got news for you. Nobody cares. Uh, we have those. They're fine. Uh, the real point of this is things uh, that were mentioned, for example, that Klaus, Klaus, Klaus mentioned in the JVM talk. Parallel garbage collection is hard. If you hit a situation where you're doing parallel garbage collection, you have multi-second pause times, much less 15-minute pause times, you, 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 you've lost. It's over, right? In the finance industry, they call it the seven-second pause. And it means that's it. You're done. You decommission the program. And usually fire everybody involved. Uh, so once you can track type state transitions and ownership statically, right? now you have some real fun. Because now you have Rust-like things in terms of tracking ownership. You have type state-like things for temporal time. And now you can start doing things entirely lock-free without even using typical lock-free programming things that include no atomic operations, but do something that is logically atomic. I'm going to show you an example of that in a minute. So uh, to be specific about the example of the memory allocator, inside a runtime, inside the allocator, uh, memory is, generally speaking, linear. Uh, you have a single reference to it, and you have an obligation to discharge that reference, that, that reference once. Right? Whether that means to transfer it to some other module, uh, to change its type, and, and, and keep the, the responsibility to discharge, or to hand the entire thing back to the operating system. That linearity is uh, exploitable. OK. Speaking of linearity being exploitable, so there's a, a paper I'm quite fond of uh, that happens to be written by a couple of people who are here today, Kassigren and Rigstad, which is at eCoop this year. And it ha encodes the idea of compare and transfer as a combination of a semantic and a type operation Guys, jump in if I get this horrifically wrong. Uh, and that's pretty neat. It means you've got a compare and swap operation that it has actual well-typed semantics. That's unusual and exciting. And actually, for non-x86 architectures, where load link store conditional is essentially how everything is encoded, I kind of think it's possible that the, the cat stuff, as it exists right now, may be sufficient. For x86 is where you have more complex uh, operations, like, ex like uh, atomic exchange and atomic fetch and add, x exchange, uh, exchange and x add. Maybe it needs more in order to express those things. It might not. That might be a compilation issue. I don't know. I want to actually want to talk to Elias about that later. Uh, but that's kind of exciting that these kinds of techniques are starting to exist. And uh, as an example of that, I'm going to show you remote deallocation. So, one of the hardest things in a memory allocator is if I allocate memory on thread one, but I need to free it on thread two. 
because what you don't want to do is have locks over memory allocator data structures. If you have any locks in your memory allocator of any kind, you lose, in my opinion. Because uh, it's perfectly possible to write entirely lock-free memory allocators. So what we want to do is we want to have some idea of how to handle a remote dealloc. In this particular allocator, there are many choices. This particular one happens to have the choice of saying what we're going to do is we're going to build out a, a, a cache of unfreed objects within thread one. And when that gets to a certain size, we're going to uh, send those back to the threads that needs to deallocate them. Is that always the right strategy? Of course not. But that's what this one happens to do. So in particular, this code um, does something quite fun. It transfers an entire linked list, not a single address, but an entire linked list to the target threads deallocation queue atomically with a single atomic operation. That's kind of interesting because if you read that code, and I suggest you have a little bit of a look at it, mostly you know you should glaze over when I show code, but this one may be a little bit of a look, um, that makes no sense. All right? Because what we have here is a, an, a relaxed order store, which if you're familiar with how that's implemented under the hood, that's just a write. That's just a store. There's no atomic operation there. Uh, now we have uh, a thread fence. Why is that needed? On an x86, that is not needed. That is dead code. That compiles to nothing. But on an ARM, that's critical. And you would never know it from this code because there's an entirely different piece of code somewhere else that needs that thread fence to exist. All right. And only on the single target architecture. And now we're going to do an atomic exchange, not a compare and swap, a straight exchange over the head and uh, the last element of the queue that I'm encoding. All right. If that makes any sense to you, you didn't read it properly. OK. And the next one is we're going to store the first element right, into the next pointer of the thing that used to be the head of the queue. OK, really? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. All right. It works. I can show you why. But it makes no sense. And the reason it makes no sense is because we aren't expressing our happens before annotations in the runtime. Instead, what we're doing is hacking together our C11, or in this case, C11, but that's just the crappy version of C11, uh, that happens to encode the semantics that we're looking for, right? So this is called weak memory programming. Uh, and in fact, these days, more and more, I don't talk about parallel programming. I talk about weak memory programming because considering particular independent threads of execution is fine and well when we're talking about um, multi and many core CPUs. It's a little fuzzy when we start talking about GPUs, and it's almost meaningless when we start talking about FPGAs. But in all cases, we're doing parallel programming over weak memory. OK, so uh, the reason that code is pretty much nonsense is it's only half of the dance, and the other half of the code is the half, is the half that makes that code make sense. And the fact that there's nothing in that code that indicates that, that there's any other code that might depend on this, is a huge, huge problem. It's a problem for correctness for the programmer, but it's also a problem for, of correctness for the compiler. It means that the compiler does not have sufficient annotation to generate correct code. It cannot be done. And that's why we, as the programmer, have to go in and do these uh, very particular target ISA operations that really all we're trying to do is express a, 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 a interfunction uh, dependency. That's all we really want to do. Okay, so uh, the second half is how we pop elements from the stat, from the uh, from the queue, and that's sort of logically why it makes sense. And when we finish it up, we get a lock-free multi-producer single consumer queue that uses one atomic operation to push an entire unbounded list of elements and zero atomic operations to pop an element. That's great. That's a super important thing. It's fantastic for performance. Getting that right across multiple architectures x86, ARM, 32 and 64-bit versions. Yeah, non-trivial and non-obvious is sort of an understatement there. OK, so let's look at that pop, because it's kind of fun. Uh, I'm going to glide through this pretty quick, but the main thing that you're looking at here is well, we look at the tail. We get not the tail, but the next pointer out of the tail. And then we look at that next pointer and see if it's null. If it isn't. We're going to assign tail to next and thread fence. 
That's all. That's all we're going to do. And what we're going to return is a pair of that next pointer and the tail. OK? Uh, first of all, this is weird because this may return null for a non-empty queue. Because in the previous uh, uh, push stuff, we didn't assign pre prev next until after we'd done an atomic exchange on the head. In the particular case of this queue, those semantics are accessible. Uh, excuse me, are ac acceptable. If you see null, it doesn't mean this queue is empty. It means you couldn't fetch an element at this time. That's a subtle distinction in terms of what that queue is. But very often in a queue, that's really all you want to know, is can I get an element right now? Now, the fact that it returns a pair has to do with uh, memory management and queues inside runtimes where you can't do things like free things. Uh, so let's just gloss over that and move on to the next thing. If you want to know about that, I'll talk after the, uh, the day's over and bore you to tears. So what's this? <laughs> Remember that other fence on the other side that made no sense? This is the other half of that fence. This is where the happens before annotation should have appeared in the code. OK. Also, completely useless on x86. Dead code. So that happens before annotation. There's some really exciting, interesting work on this from Jad Alglave. Uh, it was at the top list 2014. And there's going to be another paper in the next top list. And this is using um, uh, a language called cat, funnily enough. Two cats, one talk. But uh, what it encodes is a very, very pre precise happens before annotation, not for writing programs. It's not a programming language. It's for writing litmus tests to determine whether or not some memory model behaves the way you think it should behave. Now, originally, the idea was that this was going to do things like express a memory model for C, and it, it did. It was fantastic. But then it was discovered that this could uh, express a memory model for ARM for x86 chips. How about the one that's going to come out in the next top list uh, for Linux? Linux has its own memory model that has very little to do with C's memory model. That's interesting. And it turns out you can encode it. And another thing you can do with this thing is that you can, by combining these, a memory model for Linux and a memory model for ARM, for example, now you can have a mapping from the first memory model to the second memory model. Right? That says, given these are the semantics I want at the language level, this is my best effort for implementing those semantics at the hardware level. This is what we, can do. This is what we know we can do right now. We might in the future make a better model, uh, model on either side and, and be able to improve that mapping. We might come out with new hardware, and we could produce a memory model for that hardware. Right? And for any existing program that used a happens before annotation that was sufficiently precise, you could express the semantics for that new hardware without writing a new backend and without having to do any testing other than the memory model on the hardware itself. All right, I'm out of time, and I'm going to have to slide through some stuff. So happens before is syntax. So the result would be heavyweight. It would be hard to learn. That's, uh, is that OK? There aren't very many runtime writers in the world. Maybe that's OK. Uh, is it more or less usable for a small audience? I don't know. This is the one that I had to add. Uh, uh, Alberto's example actually is a perfect example of using a happens before annotation. His example is, is a happens before, and it's the fact that we can't express that other than in program order that causes so many of these problems. Wouldn't it be interesting if a hardware could do both Alberto's approach to uh, having load load reordering and ordered loads, and you could express that in the programming uh, language so you could have both uh, a particular ordering here and a particular ordering here in the same program interleaved because you have separate memory locations and separate, pro uh, separate requirements. That's kind of exciting. I'm going to stick right over, gloss right over this because I'm out of time. But if anyone wants to talk, talk about ABAs and CAS and ARMS and stuff, there's a kind of a fun example here. I'm not going to show the live code. Tooling. I think uh, the tooling you, you could get out of this alone would be amazing. Being able to draw graphs of memory dependencies for an arbitrary program is pretty exciting. Uh, being able to, to, when you're debugging, use mProtect to protect all memory based on whether you're executing runtime code or language level code. This is interesting stuff. All right. Here's the, here's the big one, the example of the syntax. There you go. Nothing. So if anyone's interested in this, uh, this is real work that's really happening, and I'd be very keen to talk to anyone about this. Um, and I'm going to quickly do my, the goals and non-goals, because this is 
sort of the last two slides in the summary of the whole thing. We want this low-level language. We want a tooling environment. We want CABI compatibility because we want to be able to uh, extend existing runtimes, maybe even uh, incrementally rewrite existing runtimes. Right? We don't want to say, let's start over with brand new runtimes. No, 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 no touch. On the other hand, what we do want is a language that can be used to experiment with new runtimes, as well as to work on existing industrial runtimes. Non-goals include a language for a wide audience. Right? I'd love to have some papers called Don't Read This Paper. Uh, another non-goal is a language that's easy to learn. I love to give a, talk called, a tutorial called Don't Come to This Tutorial. And uh, finally, uh, a language with any kind of high-level features, memory management, standard libraries, any of this useful stuff, so that you can have a language that is basically has a subtitle of don't use this language. This would be for a very, very specific audience. On the other hand, I think it's kind of exciting. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>